Welcome to the Briere Deprescribing Guidelines Research Team's webinar, The Steps Involved in Deprescribing, Shared Decision-Making with Patients, hosted by Dr. Barbara Farrell. What I want to do in this presentation today is give you a little bit of brief uh, background on some definitions and then really hone in on some of the literature on shared decision making and how it relates to deep prescribing with uh, what I hope are some practical examples for you. So just to start off, I, I think it's really important that we recognize up front that uh, medications are uh, intended in a very beneficial way and are used to uh, treat symptoms, uh, pain or shortness of breath, uh, slow the progression of disease, uh, reduce and reduce the risk of complications uh, from disease in a, in a preventive way. And we do have a lot of evidence that there is benefit for medications in all of these uh, circumstances. The challenge arises when uh, people are taking many, many medications and people are taking more medications than ever before. Sometimes we refer to polypharmacy as just meaning more than a certain number of medications, five or nine, uh, but more recently we've talked about it as meaning more medications uh, than needed or for which harm outweighs benefit. And the challenge here is that the more medications you take, the more at risk you are for adverse drug reactions, drug interactions, falls, fractures, functional cognitive decline, uh, non-adherence with medications, hospitalizations, and higher health care costs. And this is especially challenging for the elderly who handle and respond to drugs differently, are often frail, and are not typically uh, represented in research. Today, uh, what I'd like to do, uh, as I said, is, is focus on uh, the common steps for deprescribing, as well as this um, key literature in the field of patient and carer values and preferences around shared decision making and deprescribing, not so much on the scope and impact of, uh, of polypharmacy or general information about deprescribing. So that's why I'm giving you uh, sort of just the very brief overview of polypharmacy and I'll give you a brief overview of deprescribing as well. And then we'll hone in on five papers in particular one that uh, describes the shared decision-making approach, uh, a second, which is a systematic review of the effectiveness of decision aids, a third, which was conducted, um, a study which was conducted with older adults, interviews on their participation in shared decision-making, and then a study looking at focus groups, particularly with older adults regarding their attitudes toward deprescribing specifically, and finally a paper that proposes a model for shared decision-making in deprescribing. So in terms of definitions, uh, this is the definition that we are using uh, at Briere, that deprescribing is the planned and supervised process that differentiates it from simply non-compliance, uh, reducing or stopping medications that may no longer be of benefit or may be causing harm. And you will see a variety of different uh, definitions in the literature, but they're all essentially very similar in this regard. So how I like to explain it to patients is that, and, and even to other clinicians is that deprescribing is part of good prescribing. Backing off when doses are too high or stopping medications that are no longer needed or might be causing harm. And uh, one of the key points to get across in, in talking to people about this is that deprescribing is something that's done in partnership with a healthcare provider versus making the decision on your own uh, to stop medications. The other key, I think, important point to get across is that there can be reasons to continue taking a medication or reasons why close supervision is needed while stopping. And so that's where the importance of involving the healthcare provider uh, in the decision making is really important. And there are systematic reviews, uh, two or three published now, of medication withdrawal trials that show that reducing specific classes of medications can decrease adverse effects and improve quality of life. So we know that there is benefit to deep prescribing. Now, there's a number of published generic approaches or steps for the acts of deprescribing, and they're summarized here in a paper by Emily Reeve. And these are kind of from the clinician, the physician, or the pharmacist, nurse point of view. Uh, the first step being to compile a medication history. And I like to think of this as a history of the patient's medication experience, not just a list of drugs, but what has been their experience with their medications, both good and bad. The second step is identifying from that list potentially inappropriate medications, uh, those with less evidence for benefit or those with harm, and you can use screening criteria for this like the STOP criteria, the BEERS criteria, or anticholinergic burden scales. 
The third and the fourth steps, I think, are probably the most difficult and time consuming and where the conversations with patients really need to take place. Assessing each medication individually for the eligibility for deprescribing and then prioritizing them. Developing a plan for tapering and monitoring is not so hard as it used to be. There's a lot of different tools and guides uh, available to help with that. And, uh, and then the sixth step, I, I think, is really key and something that can sometimes be forgotten is the importance of monitoring and, and supporting the patient through the deprescribing process and documenting the results. So this is a slide that I like to show to illustrate the trade-offs uh, around continuing a medication or potentially stopping a medication. So as I said earlier, there's um, most often clearly a benefit to starting a medication. There's either evidence for effectiveness, um, evidence for an ongoing reason or indication according to a diagnosis for a medication. Where the risk comes in is um, the, the presence of side effects or drug interactions the chance that those increase, the more comorbidities and medications that you have, and the age-related changes that I mentioned earlier, as well as the impact of frailty and the consideration of changing goals and values as people age. And this can affect this benefit risk um, weighting for patients. And so this decision around stopping a medication is one that is a preference-sensitive uh, decision. And there's not enough evidence about the outcomes of different approaches um, to, to really help people make clear decisions about the benefits and harms of, of stopping a medication, which is, I think, why, it, uh, why it's so important to uh, consider shared decision making in making these decisions. So if we think about the, the benefits, risks, of, of deprescribing uh, as an action, the benefits might include reduced side effects, drug interactions, reduced um, pill burden, uh, improved quality of life. The risks, however, can include adverse drug withdrawal events, which are often the signs or symptoms that are caused by the removal of a drug. So it might be that symptoms of the underlying condition come back, or you create a physiological type of reaction, like a rebound heartburn with stopping a PPI, or maybe a new symptom that is related to a discontinuation type of syndrome. And these kinds of adverse drug withdrawal events are more common the longer you've been taking a medication, the higher the dose, if it's a short half-life, for example, in the case of benzodiazepines, if there's a history of dependence or abuse. And lack of patient buy-in has been cited as, um, as a, a challenge uh, or a risk of, that increases the potential for adverse drug withdrawal events from deprescribing. And it's this piece, I think, that really um, caught my interest early on in trying to figure out how to address the issue of, of lack of patient buy-in. So I think it comes about, again, because there's a gap between what we know about the risks or, benefit, or lack of benefit of medications, especially with age. And often patients continue to take drugs even when they say they want to take less. So there's a disconnect there. So it got me thinking about, is there a process that could facilitate healthcare decision-making that would enable people to make decisions that would leave them feeling more confident that they were doing the best thing for themselves as an individual at that point in their lives for their positive health comes. And this is what leads us to a discussion of patient engagement and shared decision-making with the premise that shared decision-making facilitates engagement and more clear decisions. So to, to define shared decision-making, I went to this paper by uh, Glenn Elwin, who uh, defines it as an approach where clinicians and patients share the best available evidence when faced with the task of making decisions and where patients are supported to consider options to achieve informed preferences. There's a number of other uh, useful definitions of shared decision-making out there. Uh, another one that I liked was clinician a uh, clinician communicates personalized information on the options, outcomes, probabilities, and uncertainties, and patients communicate the, their personal value or importance that they play on benefits and harms so that agreement on the best strategy can be reached. And this is, of course, as opposed to a 
paternalistic or informed type of model where information just flows in one direction from the clinician to the patient. And in this paper, um, the authors propose a three-step model, uh, introducing the idea of choice uh, to the patient, the choice that there could be different options, uh, then describing the options, and then helping the patients explore preferences around what matters most and making decisions. And uh, this paper, actually, I would suggest that people take a look at because it, they've got quite a few uh, conversation starters around those individual topic areas that were too large to really include in the presentation, but I think um, are valuable for people to look at. The second paper I wanted to highlight was a decision aid review published by Don Stacy's group in Ottawa on the use of decision aids. And um, the a decision aid is something that helps to prepare people to participate in decisions that involve weighing benefits, harms, and scientific uncertainty, often contains uh, graphic type information uh, that helps people understand uh, the benefits and harms and the level of uncertainty and helps to lead them to a decision. And in this review, they found 86 trials uh, that supported the, the evidence from the trials and they were all randomized controlled trials, showed that these types of decision aids uh, result in knowledge gain by patients, more confidence in making decisions, more active patient involvement, and in a lot of situations, informed patients tended to elect for more conservative uh, treatment options. So the, again, the premise is that decisions made will be better understood based on more accurate expectations about the negative and positive consequences and more consistent with personal preferences. So what is not known, and I think this is a, an important um, thing to think about in terms of future research that we want to do is that we are not as clear about whether decision aids have an effect on adherence with the chosen option, uh, patient practitioner communication, cost effectiveness, and use with low literacy populations. So all of these issues need further exploration. And there's also not a lot known about the degree of detail that's needed within a decision aid to facilitate its uh, successful use. So this next study uh, looked at the participation of very old adults in healthcare uh, decisions. And I thought it was important to include this because one of the barriers to deprescribing that's been cited is the physician's impression that older people want to defer decision making uh, to the provider. However, other literature does show that uh, the preference for decision-making involvement is variable at all ages. It's unclear uh, whether not feeling knowledgeable enough about the, their health or their medicine to make a meaningful contribution to the discussion is the issue or whether it's actually a wish to be uninvolved in the decision process. Uh, another barrier to deprescribing it, that has been cited is the patient family resistance. Uh, and physicians have also stated their own uncertainty about best prescribing practices and deprescribing decisions leading to sort of fear to recommend deprescribing, sort of a fear of, uh, of reper repercussions. And so I thought that all of these, um, they, they all made me interested in exploring how patients could be more actively involved in decisions. So in this particular paper, uh, Julie Bynum and her group interviewed uh, 29 older adults in, in the US, and they identified a number of barriers. Uh, their patients identified barriers to participation, which are summarized here. And the first is that patients often think that they have no options. Uh, and use of words like uh, routine, uh, routine blood work, uh, routine care, et cetera, that kind of wording uh, can be a major barrier. Patients often don't realize that non-action can be chosen as an option. The second barrier is around low patient activation. And what we mean by this is that there's uh, patient activation is the belief that they have an important role to play in their own health. And uh, whether you have low activation or high activation relates to how much people want to participate in decisions. Another barrier is around communication. So from the patient's point of view, hearing may be impaired, speech may be impaired, 
slow processing, um, cognitive impairment, those can all be issues that affect how the patient both uh, speaks and hears and understands what the clinician is saying. They also have the perception that clinicians were very rushed and that there was not really an opportunity to communicate with them. The next barrier uh, is when uh, patients do not seek resources. So those that sought more information about options tended to participate in decisions more highly. There was also a belief, and I found this really interesting, that the physician already knows all the relevant information about their patient values and therefore um, would automatically make decisions that were consistent with what they thought. And lastly, uh, there was an issue around patients not uh, addressing disagreement with clinicians directly. They tended to avoid conflict in a few different ways. Uh, one, by simply not commenting during the discussion and then choosing not to adhere uh, with the recommendation without informing the physician. Uh, the, the second uh, mechanism for avoiding conflict was actually to change physicians. Uh, and then the third approach was to um, you know, obtain more information and ask more questions. And the next slide illustrates for you what can happen in this conflict avoidance uh, mechanism where a patient simply chooses to not adhere to, uh, to the medication. And this was an example I had of a patient who didn't uh, want to tell their physician or their pharmacist that they weren't using their nitroglycerin patches. That's a year's worth, by the way, of <laughs> nitroglycerin patches. So in this uh, same study, uh, the team examined the decision episodes that were described by the patients, and they were able to then identify steps that made up the decision process from the patient's uh, point of view. And they identified them as six steps, recognizing that a decision is being made, identifying the options, getting medical information about those options, making their preferences known, making the actual decision, and then reevaluating the decision. And that last step was very common with regards to uh, decisions that were made about medications. As you saw from the previous slide, people would often leave the encounter and then change their mind um, about the decision that had been made during the encounter. So the implications of this that the authors describe is that clinicians need to be able to explain explicitly the options uh, because older patients might not perceive there are options. Uh, and typically it's because they think the physician is recommending a clear action that has already taken their own values into account. They also need to consider, clinicians need to consider that values and goals may change as life expectancy shortens. And that's, again, a very critical thing to be thinking about around the decision to stop a treatment. And that open communication with clinicians about the options must consider the patient values and potential disagreement. Uh, and so asking that question about how do you feel about this decision helps you to, um, you know, to ward off uh, the later disagreement that you might not know about as a clinician. So this next study was published by Emily Reeve. In this particular one, they did focus groups with older adults and their carers, specifically around the issues of deprescribing to try to understand their beliefs and their attitudes. And they used a framework from a previous systematic review of consumer barriers and enablers of deprescribing and categorized their findings into um, five themes, appropriateness, process, influences, dislike, and fear. And then also uh, did an inductive analysis uh, to ensure that they didn't uh, miss any key themes. And I just want to point out that they purposely included carers in this study because they felt that their agreement with treatment recommendations was really pivotal to adherence and attaining goals. So in terms of their results then, uh, this first theme of appropriateness, what came across was a, a really strong theme of why. Patients wanted to understand the reasons why medication might be stopped or what might be the benefit of stopping. And in some themes, they identified um, both enablers and barriers that affected whether they felt drugs should be stopped or not stopped. So the Enablers were those um, 
ideas that were brought up by patients who felt they were more likely to stop a medication. Maybe they viewed there was a lack of benefit or necessity, that there might be some potential for improved quality of life, uh, that they understood that alternatives were available or they were having drug interactions or side effects. People were less likely to support medication withdrawal if they saw benefit or initially saw the benefit of medication use when it was first started. If they had sort of an ex, uh, an acceptance that they had a medical condition, if they didn't see any current harm, or if they had been taking the medication for a longer term. In terms of process, uh, patients identified that a discussion was needed to make decisions, that it needed time and support from the clinician, including an explanation of why the decision was being made and what to expect. And I think this is a key, a key item, I think, to, uh, to think about in the prescribing process. So people expected to be informed about the need for monitoring and follow-up, and their willingness was enhanced if they understood that the withdrawal could be a trial. So in my practice, for example, it's common for me to um, make a suggestion uh, as, as an option for deprescribing, and then to um, explain that uh, we would make the change on a temporary basis, that we would find out uh, or monitor how, how things were going and give them some specific monitoring parameters and assure them that uh, if, if something negative happened, we can simply increase the dose or add the drug back again. And that seems to uh, very much help people um, with their willingness to participate in the process. And then they also wanted to know general consideration about what uh, needs to be weaned. They preferred to just do one drug uh, deprescribing at a time, and they also wanted to know if there would be a reversal of drug interactions. So for the next theme, the influences on willingness for deprescribing. And again, the participants reported that they were quite willing uh, to deprescribe if it was re recommended by their family doctor, um, but that they, many of them had encountered situations where the physician used a warning case to convince them to continue the medication, such as, you know, uh, I had a patient who tried to stop that medication and they got really severe heartburn or they couldn't sleep. So uh, there's a bit of a disconnect there with patients wanting to go with the option of reducing or stopping a medication, but being convinced otherwise. Patients also had an assumption that if the physician was um, providing repeats for the prescription, that that was a confirmation that they had at each repeat period done a medication review and confirmed that the medication was still appropriate for the patient. So I, I found that interesting too, because I'm not sure that that's always a part of the, uh, of the repeat process. Family and friends had variable influences. Uh, there was one carer who said that all family members needed to be in agreement with medication withdrawal at the end of life. Uh, some family and friends who had bad experience with stopping a medication could influence the patient's willingness to stop. And, uh, there was also uh, some discussion here about the patient's expectation to receive a prescription and the influence of family and friends on that. The next category of, uh, of themes that arose was around fear as a barrier to having medications be prescribed, fear that the condition would return, that they might miss out on future benefits, uh, that they might experience adverse drug withdrawal reactions. And lastly, there was a theme around the dislike of medications. And this was uh, actually an enabler to having medications deprescribed, sort of a desire to minimize medication use, um, a belief that lifestyle changes could be helpful to them, uh, as well as reducing cost and, and inconvenience. And um, lastly, I wanted to just say that in the inductive analysis here, a carer theme uh, emerged. And that was around this idea that the discussion of quality of life and changing care goals was more prominent uh, when you were trying to make decisions for others. So the, um, a summary of how these results might be applied uh, by healthcare professionals in their practice uh, to enhance deep prescribing was included uh, in this paper as well. And the first um, 
advice or implications they had was that family physicians, uh, according to the patients, uh, seem to be the main driver for deprescribing. Patients really recognize that their physicians have the knowledge uh, and expected them to convey information in a way they could understand. Uh, so the implication here is that physicians need to be aware of this influence and not have fear of, of patient resistance, but that they likely need supports to enable the time that it takes to have these kinds of conversations in practice. The second implication was that a process is required for deprescribing, that this discussion needs to occur. Uh, why the medication is being considered for deprescribing needs to be explained. Uh, parents, or sorry, patients and carers are open to be involved in monitoring and they expect to be informed what to monitor for and what to do if there's a change in their condition. And um, the, the other piece here, again, is to emphasize that medication withdrawal can be a trial. Part of the discussion here I found very interesting because there's some references to consumer literature around their understanding of benefits and risks. And the idea that the concept of, that they do understand the concept of competing risks and that medication use needs to be individualized. So I think being aware of that going into um, a conversation about benefits and risks is helpful. And then where there is resistance uh, from patients, that further discussion might reveal the reason. So again, that asking people how they feel about the decision um, is helpful. And that again, that shared decision-making is needed to try to get that favorable outcome and to preserve relationships as well. And to avoid that sort of conflict avoidance issue where the patient changes physicians. So the last paper that I want to describe uh, was published by uh, Jesse Jansen. And in this particular paper, they've conducted a literature review that brings together evidence from psychology, communication, and decision-making literature, focusing on the unique aspects for deprescribing decisions. And then they end with practical advice on overcoming challenges and highlighting where more work is needed. And uh, in the next few slides, what I want to do is add further description from the paper for each of these major tasks in the shared decision-making process as it relates to deprescribing. And you'll notice in the next few slides, I've got a little bit more information than I usually put on, on slides, uh, but I think it's um, helpful in terms of understanding that the large amount of content that's in these papers. So we'll go to the next slide, which is talking about this first step, creating awareness that options exist. And this relates again back to that concept that older people may not be aware that they're, that deprescribing is a possible option. So it's essential to simply identify that upfront. So um, they divide this into a, a, a few different steps. The first is around when to initiate discussion about deprescribing. And there's a number of triggers that they recommend you could use when a patient reaches a certain number of medications, when they have a new symptom that might be a side effect. You can screen using beers or stop criteria. You can look for apparent non-adherence and the community pharmacist can be very helpful in um, providing that kind of information. Or you can look for um, something that's happened that might change treatment priorities. Life transitions can be also another um, good point, a hospital admission or a new diagnosis or a new doctor that can trigger a medication review. And we find in the day hospital, uh, because patients are typically referred because they've had falls or cognitive impairment, there's usually some major life events that uh, result in them ending up at the day hospital. It's usually a good time to trigger uh, a medication review and discussions about deprescribing. The next step is to consider their attitudes toward medication or toward medicine. And uh, here the challenge is that clinicians sometimes believe that patients value medication highly and would resist any discussion uh, about communicate, about uh, deprescribing. So they, they don't bring it up, but it, uh, it is important to talk about, and their patient's willingness to talk about it is influenced by uh, the communication skills and experience of their prescriber uh, and the degree to which they trust them. Having side effects opens, uh, increases the openness of older people's uh, interest in having a deprescribing discussion, and education and information also increases their willingness. So having information available to give them about the different options. 
The next uh, important step in creating awareness is to keep cognitive biases in mind. So the status quo bias is something that's very well recognized. It's just simply the preference for not changing anything. The, the old uh, don't rock the boat sort of uh, statement that we sometimes hear. And because of this, um, it can be it can be challenging to, um, I guess, ch to challenge the status quo. Therapeutic inertia is a recognition of a problem so that, that a patient is taking a potentially inappropriate uh, medication, but a failure to act, and also considering omission bias. So this is the sort of willingness to risk, people are more willing to risk harm from inaction but than from action. And once a medication has been started in and continued for some time unchanged, continuing it is then perceived as inaction and can sometimes be interpreted as patient resistance to change versus um, you know, identifying that really it's this omission bias that is uh, at the core. The next step is considering uh, language when starting medications to avoid some of these cognitive biases. And that would be um, avoiding the kinds of statements like you're gonna be taking this medication for the rest of your life, or this is a lifelong medication. Uh, and there's also a recommendation here in the paper that guidelines need to include information about when to review or stop medications to try to prevent these sorts of, uh, of statements from being inaccurately made. The next um, uh, theme within this creating awareness uh, component is around multidisciplinary decisions and companion involvement. And here is just a recognition that when there are multiple prescribers, it's hard to know who should initiate deprescribing and that it can be hampered uh, by poor communication about uh, prescribing amongst clinicians uh, and, and even amongst um, uh, patients and, and carers. So the next uh, major component of this model is discussing options and the benefits and harms of those options. So here, um, you know, it's important to understand that there can be changes in cognition and, and effective processes that are going to influence how a patient can process and understand the information. It's important to recognize that people, older people tend to fo focus on positive uh, information. They tend to seek less information and they sometimes have difficulty understanding information about options. Hearing and speech loss can also complicate uh, understanding, as I mentioned earlier with the, um, with the other model for shared decision-making. And understanding potential benefits and harms can be challenged with poor literacy, numeracy skills, difficulty with quantitative or probabilistic type of information. Um, this is where some of the decision aid um, literature comes out of in terms of trying to use visual formats or pictographs that might be helpful to help people understand probabilities. Communicating uncertainty is probably one of the biggest challenges for deprescribing just because the evidence is limited around benefits and harms. Physicians are not uh, necessarily confident in communicating uncertainty. Better communication tools are needed to help with that. And as well, when you're discussing uncertainty with patients, um, you can actually cause some cognitive overload, uh, decision avoidance, or worry that might impair decision making. So there's a fine balance there in terms of the amount of information uh, or the type of information that's communicated. And then lastly, uh, physicians have less confidence about deprescribing preventative medications uh, and also fear that they're, or sorry, feel that they're under more pressure uh, to pres continue prescribing preventative um, medications due to um, their inclusion in clinical guidelines. So uh, one of the things I was thinking of is that it's notable that so far the deprescribing guidelines that we've developed here at Briere over the last five years are primarily for drugs that treat symptoms, PPIs, benzodiazepine receptor agonists, antipsychotics, which are among those groups of the symptomatic uh, type medications that may actually be easier to deprescribe. So the next component is exploring patient preferences for the different options. Uh, and then helping patients address their preferences, their goals, their priorities. And the challenge here is that preferences on older people um, can vary uh, and they're not necessarily stable. So people construct their preferences as they acquire more information. 
their emotions can play a role. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, this idea that their clinicians already know their preferences can kind of decrease their perceived need to be involved in a decision. So weighing benefits and harms is a little more complex uh, in older people because you need to take into account this issue of decreasing life expectancy, which of course is uh, often hard to estimate. And this type of conversation can be challenging for clinicians to talk to patients about. So that's something where I try to think what are what are the some good questions that um, might help the clinician to understand patient preferences a little bit better. And I think the, the questions that I use in my own practice are simple things like, how do you feel about this? Or even explaining, I think what would be helpful for a, uh, a clinician who the patient might feel they already know their preferences, you could actually overtly say, I don't know how you feel about this. Tell me how you feel. So the next step is actually making the decision, integrating all of this information uh, and uh, either collaboratively making that decision with the patient, understanding uh, the, the decision that's made specifically by the patient or that's deferred to the clinician. And here, again, uh, we recognize that most older people do prefer to participate in medical decision making, though that can be influenced by their health. Um, even those who prefer to delegate the decision, and this is what some of the literature shows, they still want to discuss options, their preferences, and they still want to receive information. And we can support patient autonomy by eliciting their goals, values, inviting them to participate, even if they don't actually make uh, the final decision. And then lastly, I just want to highlight again that deprescribing is an ongoing process and that uh, decisions for deprescribing are best made in a staged approach with careful monitoring for withdrawal or adverse effects. And uh, D. Mangan uses a, a great phrase to refer to this that I found is caught on with both uh, clinicians and patients is the pause and monitor approach. It's, you know, one of the options is that we can pause this medication for a month and we can monitor this, this, and this and see how you do. And there's always um, the possibility that, you know, if you're not doing as well without the drug, then we can restart it. So in terms of advice um, from, from this particular paper, the recommendation again is that shared decision-making should be an integral part of the deprescribing process, but its implementation in clinical practice can, can seem complex. So at a very minimum, what we wanna do is inform older people in their care is that there is an option to deprescribe and then invite and support them in trying to express their preferences and making a decision. So understanding that it's time consuming, the, um, the paper also points out that protected time and dedicated resources and potentially specific remuneration are necessary in order to really make this happen. And that we need more evidence on the best ways to communicate benefits and harms information and to elicit their preferences. One of the things I would recommend that people do is actually um, go to this particular article uh, and the, the references are included um, throughout the presentation in the slides, as well as at the end of the presentation in bibliography, because there's a great table in this particular article that has a summary of these um, four steps, along with practical advice and priorities for future research. So I've kind of just touched on um, the overview here, and you can get more detail in the article. So putting this all together, uh, there's no reference here, because I just um, thought this up over the last few days. When I think about all of the um, content in the articles I've just discussed, I was thinking, what are the steps of deprescribing from the patient or carer's point of view? Because we always see the steps explained from the clinician point of view, what the clinician should do. So thinking about this coming from a member of the public, I think what my advice would be, tell your clinician about your experience with your medications. Don't assume that the clinician knows that already. Ask for, seek information about different options. Those could be alternatives to medication, a safer medication. It could be reducing or stopping the medication. It could be options about how fast to taper a medication. 
The third step, think about and describe your goals or preferences with regards to the, that treatment and deprescribing. Then contribute your input to the decision being made. If you disagree with a suggestion, explain why. So don't just get the prescription filled and save them all up at home uh, while you're not taking them. And then lastly, reevaluate the decision afterward. Think about it. Have you have I missed anything in my discussion with my clinician? Am I feeling less confident? Do I need to talk to them again before I firmly make the decision? And then in the next uh, couple of slides, I've included some ideas that clinicians could use to apply this process uh, to deprescribing. So this idea of um, introducing choice or creating some awareness of choice for the patient, uh, you can get at by saying, you know, several, several of your medications could be contributing to problems with falls. I'd like to tell you about some different options to reduce the risks from these medications. So that's creating awareness that there are options. In the next step, discussing the options and the benefits and risks, it's helpful to ask questions like, what do you already know about medications that might cause falls? And again, everything in italics here is just the example of falls. It's possible that these particular drugs could all be contributing to falls risks. We can try reducing the dose or stopping one or more of these medications. And then the, here's the bit about the benefits risks, actually using the language of benefits and risks, which we know from some of the previous papers I described that people do understand this language. If we reduce the dose or stop your sleeping pill, there's a risk you might have difficulty sleeping for a few nights. And we'll need to focus on how you can get a good night's sleep without medication. On the plus side, if the sleeping pill is reduced or stopped, benefits are that you may feel less tired in the morning and have fewer falls. So that's kind of an example of how I might go about this sort of discussion with a patient in the day hospital. So the next uh, category or, or step uh, was to help the patient explore options. So these are some of the questions that I think might be helpful to, to get to that. From your point of view, what matters most to you? How do you feel about these options? Is this something you'd consider? Um, I'm thinking in particular a patient I had last week who was on a high dose of pergabalin, uh, and we discovered through the discussion that um, they were they had noticed, in fact, some increased confusion when the dose had been increased. Uh, and so this was how I approached it. You know, how would you feel about reducing the dose? Is that something that you consider? Um, and then saying, what if we reduce the dose to 100 milligrams twice a day? Is that something you'd consider? And then helping them make the decisions. Are you ready to decide? Do you need more time? Would you like to try the pause and monitor approach where we might temporarily stop the drug, monitor it carefully, and restart it if needed? So what I wanted to do next is just uh, demonstrate some of the tools that we've developed through the deprescribing guidelines work that we think help to um, address uh, how, how to, um, I guess, have these discussions with patients. So you know that we've, um, we've published deprescribing guidelines, we've created decision support algorithms for clinicians to use, but they're not necessarily patient friendly. So we've also produced these materials that we hope will inform patients about options so that they feel more comfortable either raising the issue with their prescriber and discussing the options in order to be able to participate in shared decision making. And this particular one is an example of an infographic that has high level information and pictures that help explain or illustrate some of the information that we're trying to convey to patients. This is a more detailed patient pamphlet that could be used to communicate information to patients as well. Uh, and it's each of these things are available on our website. I'll provide the link at the end of the presentation. And then uh, our master's uh, student, Wade Thompson, who's now a PhD student in Denmark, created uh, a decision aid as part of his master's program around uh, PPI deprescribing. And I, he worked with um, members of Don Stacy's group in putting this together. And so I would urge people to take a look at that. It's on our website, along with a, a link to a, a publication on the, uh, on the development of the decision aid. So in summary, what I've done on this slide is just illustrated the steps in deprescribing from the clinician's point of view, the general steps for shared decision-making, 
and then the steps that patients or carers could involve in order to try to have these types of conversations with their clinicians. I am at this point finished the presentation itself. I have some uh, information here on the next couple of slides with links for um, websites that have more resources that could be helpful to you. And I would be very happy to take any questions that have arisen. I think we have about 10 minutes left and uh, Steve was gonna pop over if there are any questions or if you want to put them in the chat box, I would be happy to address them. Okay, it's looking like there aren't any questions for the presentation. So I'll let you know that the session was recorded and uh, we'll be able to send around a link uh, or we'll have that on the website if people would like to listen to the session again. Or if you have any questions, you can certainly um, certainly send them along to our deprescribing at briere.org email address. And I would like to thank everyone for participating today. And sorry? Um, I'm sorry, are you finishing the conversation or can I ask a question? Um, sure, you can ask a question. All right. So the question is, you have developed, um, I think, uh, five guidelines for deprescribing or four. And which of the groups do you find the most challenging to um, for patients to buy in and then to follow through? That's a very good question. I, um, I'm trying to think about that because we haven't done a specific study comparing all five uh, and, and trying to get a sense from uh, patients which are more challenging. I can say in, in my own practice, uh, I think... I think it would be fairly equivalent amongst them. I don't know if there's anyone else uh, on the call who has experience with all five that would like to comment. Certainly when I've done presentations with uh, family physicians and, and public members, there's been great interest in all of them. Uh, sites quite often pick the, uh, the PPI deprescribing a guideline as one they'd initially like to try to implement, I think because it's very easy to monitor for the recurrence of heartburn. Uh, what, so, what, about, what about the quetiapine or the, uh, <clears throat> the antipsychotics for insomnia or inappropriate prescribing? Did you find that difficult? I mean, you said it's all equal for those five, but I was just thinking sleep is an important issue. And... Mm -hmm. Yeah, sleep is definitely... <laughs> Sorry, I think we'll have to ask people to mute their microphones. Thanks. Um, sleep is definitely something that's very important to people. I do a lot of uh, work with people around the, uh, the benefits and risks of, uh, or the, I should say the lack of benefit and the risks associated with sleeping pill use. And because I'm working in an interprofessional team, we also do a lot of education around sleep hygiene, uh, we look at reducing other medications, for example, caffeine uh, and alcohol that are impairing sleep. Uh, so I, I think I'm probably not personally having as, as many challenges with that group of drugs. And I don't uh, work uh, in dementia in terms of B, uh, BPSD, BPSD uh, treatment. Oh, I've got another question here. So I'm going to move to that one because we've only got a couple of minutes left. This is uh, from Joanne uh, LeClaire, and she writes, the geriatric day program does not involve admission to hospital. What happens when a patient needs monitoring overnight for withdrawal symptoms? Do you facilitate admission to hospital? So that's a good question. So the way the geriatric day hospital program works is that patients are uh, coming to the day hospital two half days a week, usually for a period of eight to 10 weeks. And so it does give us an opportunity for frequent monitoring for uh, withdrawal symptoms and also for making a number of changes over the course of that time. So it's it would not be common that we would need to monitor a patient overnight for withdrawal symptoms, primarily because we tend to choose very slow tapering processes. And we also initiate tapering at times 
uh, when we expect uh, that there might that withdrawal symptoms might occur. So, for example, if uh, let's say we had slowly tapered an SSRI over um, you know a couple six weeks, and we were getting to the point where we were actually going to stop the very last of the smallest pills, uh, and the patient was due to come to the day hospital Tuesday and Thursday, we might have them. Um, stop the, actually stop the medication the Monday or Tuesday so that we can see them very quickly um, after they've stopped the medication, sort of within the time period where we might expect them to demonstrate that they're having some withdrawal. And we provide our information so that they can call us. Uh, we're open five days a week, so people can call at any time. There have been occasional um, circumstances where people have um, had a symptom during the evening or at night uh, that they haven't been able to manage where they have gone to um, to emerge or the very rare instance where, um, you know, because a number of changes were being made and there were other uh, com complexities of the patient's care where they've been admitted to rehab um, for some of the deprescribing. So I've got an, another question here. Uh, primary care providers are often reluctant to discuss deprescribing when the medications have been prescribed by other physicians. What do you, oh, okay, there's three questions here. So yes, um, so this is sort of the challenge when, uh, you know, there's multiple um, prescribers involved in the, uh, in the care of the patient. We often take a, a bit of a coordination approach in terms of um, making recommendations, not just to the primary care provider, but also sending notes, uh, memos off to the specialist uh, to get their opinion as well. So that what we're bringing together for the patient is the perspective of all of the physicians uh, involved in their care and uh, trying to balance the, uh, the agreement or sometimes the disagreement uh, between them. The next question, what do you do with patients who do not engage? Um, this, this very rarely happens to me personally because I use a lot of these processes about um, making options available. One of the things that I do at the very beginning of each of my interviews with patients is that I say, um, my job is to make sure your medications are working and not causing any problems. What questions do you have about your medications? And this opens it up immediately to the idea that um, I'm there for them, that I'm, I'm asking them what concerns or questions they have. Almost always, 99% of the time, people say, I'm taking too many medications, what can I stop? Very rarely, someone will say, I don't have any questions. Um, but as we go through and I um, gather information from them about how well each medication is working, um, what problems they've had with the medication, et cetera, they, they tend to become more open and ask more questions. One of the things I avoid doing during my initial interview is providing any kind of counseling advice or education about the medication. My job is to collect information from the patient about their experience with their medications, and that helps patients engage. As soon as you start pouring information, um, you know, into their ears, uh, they, they often stop listening um, because I think they hear from a lot of healthcare providers, you should do this, you should do that. Uh, and they don't, they don't very often get an opportunity to express what they think they should do. And then the last question is, have these processes been incorporated into electronic medical record as props? Uh, not that I know of. Uh, there is some work with each of the deprescribing guidelines uh, to incorporate them into an app. Uh, we're working on that right now. So the first app should be available in July for the PPI guideline. That would be as close to, um, you know, a, a, at the bedside decision support type of tool. Uh, we have talked to a couple of other companies about uh, incorporating them into the electronic medical record. We've talked to uh, CPHA about incorporating them into RXTX. Uh, so making them available um, to making that information available around the steps for the deprescribing guidelines, but not necessarily the steps for shared uh, decision making. But that's um, it's a good question and uh, something that we can uh, investigate a little further.
So that's the end of the questions. And uh, given the time, I think we will wrap things up right now. But again, I encourage you to submit, uh, submit additional questions if you like, and uh, we can uh, prepare some answers for these. And I would like again to thank all of you for listening. And we will provide information about how to link if you want to listen or share uh, this recording with anyone else. And we encourage you to participate in our next uh, webinar which um, will be advertised via Twitter, and Steve will be sending out some information to um, this week's participants to let you know when the next one is. Thanks again for participating. Bye-bye.